I finally did it. After weeks of trial and error, I managed to build the circuit I had been hinting about in the, my last couple of videos, a programmable digital music box. And I know for a fact that some of you figured out what I was trying to do. Hi, Monty. But in case you didn't, the digital music box was built up from a combination of a bunch of my previous projects. Um, it's basically a 555 sound generator, which is in this area, and it has a selectable frequency, which is done with these, this circuitry here. And it's hooked up to a RAM chip, which is addressed with a adjustable clock uh, counter that sets the address for the chip. And the RAM chip I'm using is from the 80s, so it's really old. And it only supports four bits for each of 256 memory locations. So my music box's songs can only have up to 256 beats with a maximum of 16 possible individual notes. I will be using the term notes uh, somewhat loosely throughout this video. I'm also using the term music loosely. Let's call it artistic license. Um, and I'd also like to apologize in advance to any musicians that might be listening and probably everyone else within earshot. So I set the whole circuit up so that uh, memory value 0000, 000, 000 generates a silent note, which I needed between the notes to keep them from running together. And then the values from 0001 up to 1111 have increasingly higher pitches, like this. To use the music box, I just need to program a sequence of memory locations with note values one by one. And then play the whole thing back from the start. Getting all of this to work turned out to be a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. Um, the first thing I needed to figure out was a way to adjust the frequency of the 555 without having to manually turn a potentiometer. Uh, the way I knew to vary the frequency was by changing the resistance of R1 or R2 in a basic 555A stable circuit. So I needed a way to get a digital value that somehow selected an analog resistance value. I thought I might be able to adapt my piano keyboard project somehow. Uh, my first thought was that I could just use a single bit to encode the button presses and then wire everything up sort of the same way. So basically a single bit would be turned on at any given time to select the current note. But my RAM chip only supports four bits, and if I did it that way, I'd only have four notes. Well, three really, because I need a rest note. So to get more bits and thus more notes, I could chain more than one RAM chip together maybe, but that didn't really seem right. It felt wasteful to not be using all the four bits of each RAM location because with four bits, I should have 15 notes and then one rest note, which seemed like plenty to be able to play a few recognizable songs. I really shouldn't need 16 individual bits to accomplish this. So I wanted a better way. So then I remembered that connecting resistors in parallel is a thing, and that depending on the combination of parallel resistances, uh, you get a different overall resistance. So I thought maybe I could get a bunch of note combinations that way. So if I just had maybe four resistors in parallel that were each somehow being turned on or off, depending on which of the four bits were high or low, I could get all the notes I need. So I wired up something like this with some push buttons to test it out, and it seemed like it worked pretty well. I had also discovered that I had to double each resistor value so that I could mix any combination together and then still get a unique resistance value as a result. Now the push buttons worked, but I needed to hook this up to my RAM chip somehow. And since I was thinking about things switching off and on, uh, transistor seemed like the right tool because that's, you know, it's sort of a switch, right? So I don't have any actual footage of a lot of these earlier experiments, and it's been so long since I did them that now I'm forgetting a bunch of the details, but I remember the first thing I tried was to hook up a push button uh, to a single NPN transistor so that it switched on and off when I pressed the button, and that's, that's pretty basic stuff. I did something like that early on in one of my earlier videos. But I had a 555 sound generator circuit to patch into this somehow, so I thought maybe if I moved one of the timing resistors from the 555 sound generator circuit onto the emitter or collector of the transistor, and I don't remember which I did, I probably tried them both, and then hooked the other side of the transistor to 5 volts, then 
maybe that'd work, or maybe hook the other side of the transistor to ground or whatever, you know? So, so basically I just replaced a resistor in the 555 circuit with a switched resistor, I guess. And I'm drawing this now from memory, but I think this is roughly how I had things hooked up. And despite how terrible this drawing is, it seemed to work. When I pressed the button, the sound would turn on. And then when I didn't press the button, there was no sound. So that seemed like a good start. So then I hooked up uh, three more transistors with buttons and different resistor values and then hooked them all together in parallel uh, to test my theory again. And it sort of worked. I could push any combination of the now four bu push buttons and I would get different tones. And so I was thinking, you know, I was onto something here. The obvious next step was to replace my push buttons with the output of the RAM chips since, of course, that's the ultimate goal. Okay, so this is hooked to this bit and you can see it flashing sometimes but it's not turning the transistor on. So there's that bit on the scope. You notice it's not going up to five volts there. I'm thinking it's just not enough to turn it on. So when I disconnect it from the RAM chip bit and just plug it straight into five, it, the sound turns on, the transistor turns on because it's high enough voltage, I think. So the output from the RAM chip is just not enough to do it. The transistor didn't seem to be turning all the way on or something like that. I, and I tried varying the resistor I used on the base of the transistor and I even removed it entirely, but it didn't seem to make much difference. It seemed like sometimes it would turn on and then sometimes it wouldn't, like it was really inconsistent. And I got pretty stuck here for a while because I just, I didn't know what was going on. Now, if you watch some of my prior videos when I was working on the individual parts of this project, you might remember that I noticed once that as I press the right button while programming bits into my RAM circuit, the output LEDs got brighter. And I had thought I'd track that down to the RAM chip output voltage being lower than I expected, like around 2.4 volts instead of the five or so that I thought it should be. And I started thinking that maybe this had something to do with why my transistor hookup, what, you know, setup wasn't working. And sure enough, when I manually pressed the right button, then the transistor would turn on all the way. Then I thought to try and remove the LED from the RAM output, and suddenly it could switch the transistor more consistently, even when I wasn't pressing the right button. So if I put the LED back in, you know, it immediately goes bad again. And notice the voltage level is down, and it's hopping up and down for some reason. Although it never goes all the way down. So that's very curious. I wonder, I don't know what that means. But it's pretty obvious that the LED in there is causing a problem. So maybe this is some combination of lack of voltage or maybe lack of current through the RAM chip or, you know, it could be either one, could be both. I don't know. Eventually I remembered that buffer chips exist and that one of the main purposes of them is, is you know, to boost signals back up to full strength. And since I was dealing with a weak signal here, maybe I should try using a buffer between the RAM output and the transistor input. So possibly a solution, if this works, is to put the LEDs on the other side of the buffer because then it will have been boosted. Because I know that these TTL chips I've been using can definitely drive an LED and do other stuff. So it could be that this RAM chip simply can't do that. Since the buffer chip actually has two channels on it and I was only using one of them, I used the other half of the chip to boost the output of the RAM signals in the other direction. Now again, I don't have good footage to go with this part because I was really frustrated at the time and not recording much of it, but after hooking up more than one transistor to test the note mixing idea, it just didn't seem to work the way I expected it to. And there were a couple problems as I remember. One was that the transistors themselves were affecting the overall resistance, which was making it hard to tune things because the final output resistance and thus the resulting tone would vary in what felt like an unpredictable way, depending on which combination of transistors were on and off. I also remember noticing what seemed like feedback or something that was coming back into the buffer chips output somehow. So I remember I had hooked up the scope to one of the outputs of the buffer to check something, and that even when the bit was off, there was voltage there sometimes, depending on which other bits had their transistors turned on. And that seemed bad because Basically, it's the whole bus conflict thing all over again. So somehow there seemed to be a signal that was like sent back into an output pin somehow, like through the transistor. 
Well, it didn't seem to have broken anything, but I'm pretty sure that that's a bad idea. So uh, remember that each output bit had a transistor resistor sub circuit that they were connected to, and then those were connected in parallel to each other. So the final resistance would vary depending on which bit was turned on. I didn't and still don't have a solid understanding of what was happening, but I remember wondering if the direction of current was changing on me. And so that prompted me to start playing with a diode to try and stop the backward flow into the output pins. And that's when I discovered that I could do everything I needed without any transistors at all. Okay, this is a mess over here, and a lot of this stuff isn't hooked up. But I actually have it working with just diodes now, no transistors. They're sitting here, but they're not being used. So the signal comes over here through a diode into a resistor. Both sides of these resistors are connected together with this green jumper, which are then hooked into the 555 circuit over here. The resistors are essentially letting current pass in parallel with each other. And so when the two are both turned on, it changes the resistance because two parallel resistors have a different lower resistance than individually. So that's creating the combinations here. And I had to put the diode in here because otherwise I think the current was sort of looping back around in the case where one or one or the other of this was off. So it wasn't really working. But now with the diode there, that prevents that the loop back from occurring. I believe that's what's going on anyway. And so now it seems to work. Connecting each of my four resistors in series to a diode and then connecting those together in parallel so that the resulting parallel resistance replaced R1 from the 555 circuit instead of R2 uh, seemed to totally solve all of my problems. And as an added bonus, it was a lot simpler too. This drawing really is terrible. Now that I thought I finally had all the pieces working together, I spent hours rewiring and rearranging the boards so that they were a bit more tidy. I was careful to make sure the main input buttons were handy at the bottom because I knew I'd be using them a lot to program the songs. And I probably should have moved the clock step button down from the top too, but I didn't really want to mess with that part of the circuit. And this had already taken such a long time as it was. And finally, it was done. The first full song I programmed was Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, which I've actually already played for you. Uh, and then I decided to, you know, kick it up a notch. So I came up with a mapping of my available notes to musical scale notes, and I'm sure it's not even remotely accurate, but I kind of arbitrarily assigned my second lowest note as middle C, and then worked up from there to give myself some room to play a few simple songs. So I looked up sheet music online and just walked through the notes in the song and converted them to the matching binary values I had assigned and made a list so that I could program it. And the version of Old MacDonald I found here was using quarter, half, and eighth notes, so I assigned a beat of one to the eighth note, since that was the shortest one I would need, and then two for quarter notes and four for half notes. And each note also had a single beat of silence between them, so you could tell them apart. And I'm sure that messes up the timing musically. And then I, I wrote the timing next to each note on my list. And so, for example, one plus one meant that it was one beat of the note and one silence, or two plus one meant two beats of the note followed by one beat of silence, and so on. So every beat had to be encoded, so each individual beat takes one slot of RAM, and I have to advance the memory address by a single step between each one, and I have to do that manually. This process was very tedious and error-prone, and the mistakes were brutal. I usually wouldn't notice a mistake until after the song was done and I had played it back. If the mistake was a missing beat or something like that, I, I can't just go back and insert it because there's no way to do that. So I, I'd have to reprogram every single beat after the mistake. And even just identifying the mistake in beat was hard because, you know, I could only step through them one by one. After the programming was finished, switching to playback is as simple as resetting the memory back to location zero and then switching the clock to automatic mode.
once I started getting the hang of it and then got into kind of a rhythm, uh, programming the songs wasn't just too bad. And it actually went faster than I thought it would. The problem really was the mistakes because you'd have to start all over. So that, that was a thing that was super time consuming. Sure, none of the songs sound great and everything's a bit out of tune, but it is working. How about a more epic song? Boop, boop, boop. Okay, yeah, if only it sounded that good. Here's what it really sounded like. Okay, yeah, that was a badly out of tune Rick roll, but I just couldn't resist. Actually, and this is a true story, the one thing that kept me going throughout this entire project, despite its difficulties, was that I had had the idea that it would be really funny to go through all this effort of building a music playing circuit, only to rickroll everyone with it. And now I have, so I guess mission accomplished. Well, now I have to decide what to do with this. It's, it's not very practical to use, and of course it doesn't sound very good. Plus, it can only hold one song at a time, and even after all the trouble of programming that one song, it loses it the moment you switch off the power. Still though, it's pretty cool. And this was such a big project that I'd hate to just take it apart now, but I think leaving it on the breadboard is probably not the best idea because it's easy to accidentally disconnect things. I'm thinking maybe I might transfer it to a perf board and then solder it all together or something like that to make it more permanent. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean. I'll probably hardly ever use the thing again, but I'd sort of like to keep it, you know? It, it was a big project. All right, well, that's it. This video took me a lot longer to make than I expected, and the process was filled with uh, frustration and mistakes, but in the end, I got this to work, and I'm, I'm actually pretty darn proud of it, really. So hopefully you enjoyed the journey, too, and uh, maybe I'll see you around next time. Bye.